what Pulse is, is an experiment from BioBeats as we merge entertainment and healthcare. What you're seeing on the screen is a list of genres and music. Inside each one of those packs is a whole bunch of stems, musical stems. And when you launch it, the optical sensor on the back of your iPhone turns on, you put your finger on it, and when you put your finger on it, we start picking up your heart rate. And over the course of 60 seconds, we look at your heart rate variability. This, in essence, is a biometric signature. We take that original biometric signature and in real time attribute musical stems, musical uh, composition to your heart rate variability, and in essence, compose a piece of music directly from your heart. What you're seeing on the screen right now is mon many more people than just the people in this room are streaming their heartbeats in. We have thousands and thousands of people around the world that are using this experiment to monitor their hearts over time. From Belgium to Denmark and on and on, we've done this experiment um, a couple times and we're taking to the next level here at Digital Health Summit. Simultaneously to your heartbeats coming through the app, they're being aggregated at the DJ booth. And so the DJ is understanding an average pulse, the average emotion of the crowd. This is DJ Eric Sharp, one of the world's first biometric DJs. He's using your heartbeats and heartbeats from around the world to build his set. We'll talk a little bit later about why, <laughs> but it's pretty darn cool, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Davide, data. 9,136 heartbeats have been collected, and as we start figuring out an average BPM, we'll start building that set. Show them fractals. Simultaneously to real-time music, it's obviously a little lagging hitting the screen here, but those are real-time fractals, if you will, that are also being composed over the course of you taking your biometric reading. Ideally, we're going to engage people in this app and many more around how we can engage people in doing their biometric readings and man monitoring their health. We want to make monitoring your health a lot more fun than it already is or isn't. So we'll just follow through for a full session and then we'll start our panel, but we'll leave, we'll leave the data aggregating over the course of the entire session and we'll leave it open through CES just to show how many heartbeats we're collecting. Thank you, Nadine. Very cool. Well, welcome everyone. I see everyone it's slowly trickling in, but um, I think we're getting ready, ready to start. We're gonna switch over to the um, digital health slides. <laughs> Much less interesting than the BioBeat slides. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Jill Gilbert. Uh, I, I actually know a lot of you in the room, but um, if I don't know you, uh, I produce this uh, great event that started, I think, five years ago. And um, as you can see, is kabooming. So we're really, really excited by it. And um, it just shocks me every year, uh, the developments and what I get to learn just as a uh, kind of passerby in the space and um, the, becoming immersed with the things that are changing in healthcare. Um, it's, it's pretty staggering and kind of watching what's happened with the Affordable Care Act this year, uh, watching, uh, watching new developments with passive monitoring, which to me is the most exciting because you know, I'm lazy, and uh, 
I, I don't, I don't want to have to kind of do things <laughs> and do a lot, so um, aside from this. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see the developments in that area. So we have an unbelievable two days. Um, we've curated some, un what I think are incredible sessions. They, each one, every time someone asks me, you know, what's your favorite? I'm like, I, I, I can't even pick one. So, um, but this one actually, uh, this next one that we're going to talk about it, it is one of my favorites because I have a, a lot of interest. Sorry, it sounds like there's a train rolling by. Um, a lot of a lot of interest in branding, but I want to uh, start by thanking um, uh, our our sponsors. We literally could not do it without them. And as a matter of fact, many much of the inspiration that these sessions, when we bring them all together. Um, it comes from them and endless calls that I do with them. So it's fantastic. So we want to thank our platinum sponsors and our gold sponsors. And of course, please visit every single booth downstairs because there are just some incredible things and I wish I had more time to go spend with them. So um, <clears throat> let's, let's dive in. Our first session is called Reaching Brand Nirvana. Uh, as I sit and talk to lots of digital health companies, I find that a lot of them you know, spend a lot of time on technology as as you should, <laughs> but uh, some of the some of the greatest stuff that comes out is uh, does not get recognized, and I feel like um, one of the things that we can do is help inspire and help inspire you and bring some of the best branding. Uh, crackpot team to the, to, to, to the stage uh, to help you talk about that, inspire you, and so um, I'm I'm going to bring them up right now. Why don't you guys come up and then I'll, and then I'll do uh, introductions and I apologize. Nadim, can we, have you joined? Sorry, I should have done it before. Wow. Got distracted. Got distracted by the bio beats. So I'm going to start by introducing Alexander von Plato, who has has been with uh, spoken with me. God, for almost what three years now? Yay, anniversary! Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> she's the president and global chief creative officer of Digitas Health. And this year, um, I always do something a little different. This year, I chose mottos, and um, uh, rather than have you read every read everyone's bios to you, you can definitely partake in those in your in your program. So, Alexandra's motto: Great healthcare marketing is all about helping people make more informed, more confident choices. We call it helping, not selling. Thank you. Sorry, all oh, my stuff. Thanks for calling us crackpots. <laughs> Sometimes people think branding is sort of a crackpot science and an exercise. Um, but you know, we're here to sort of debunk some of that and hopefully uh, create some, some goals and some guidelines for a lot of the people who are innovating in this space. I'm so thrilled to be back this year at CES at the Digital Health Summit and to watch the explosion I think we were seeing news that it's 40% growth in the footprint of the digital health um, companies and products that have come to CES this year. And it's so important because this is the space where technology and design can really transform and even save people's lives. So we're really excited to talk about how brands have a role in that. And I know that a lot of people rushed to this conference, sent, spent the last couple of months of their lives getting their demos ready, getting their PowerPoint presentations ready, getting their technology to run. And they worked on all that functional componentry of their product. But what we want to talk about today is the emotional componentry of their product, which we call the brand. The brand, which is really part of your customer's navigation system. It's the feelings, the beliefs, the impressions they have that help them make choices, help them choose your product over somebody else's product. That's the role of brand. It's the emotional componentry of your product. And with me here today to talk about how brand has a role in, in teasing out and making those distinctions between products and and brands are three really interesting and diverse panelists. The first is Nadim Kassam, who is, I would call, the quintessential startup guy and entrepreneur. In fact, Nadim is the guy who innovated the whole area of quantified self, the quantified self movement, which really grew out of inventions and products that Nadim innovated in the basis science business that he built and the basis product. 
And here today, as he just showed you, he's experimenting further with creating um, new technology that's really about adaptive technology and how it creates engagement for people to get involved in their health. Also with us here today is Monica Austin-Smith. Monica was just recently named Forbes 30 Under 30 for Hollywood Insiders. And her job is to bring the brand of the biggest loser, one of the most popular and long-living health programs on television, to life and to really go out beyond the television brand into books, into experiences, into vacations, and really build a media brand in health. And also with us is David Ohlers. David is representing a real brand manager, a brand marketing guy from his toes up. He is at General Mills, the venerable company, the makers of Wheaties and Cheerios, the company that taught us about healthy breakfast and about wholesome goodness. Um, David's going to talk about how he's bringing those brands to life today across multiple platforms and keeping them relevant. So as we explore this whole changing, transforming healthcare environment, we're all go also going to talk about the changing and transforming brand environment and how new channels and new customers are shaping the way brands go to market today. And let's get started. Hi. Hey. Good morning. So the first question I have is, you have a product and you have a brand. What does your brand stand for versus what does your product do? I'll start with you, Monica. Such an interesting question as it relates to a TV property. Um, you know, we, uh, as a, pro a producer or a studio, we make lots of different programs. Um, and it's rare that they can uh, sort of bridge between being an entertainment platform, a la what we did with The Office or any of our other programs. But with something like Biggest Loser, um, it really became sort of uh, on the forefront of talking about obesity and the epidemic uh, that uh, it is now. Um, and all the sort of health-related issues that uh, come along with it, from diabetes to heart disease. Um, so, so we've now become this resource for people over the course of the last 10 years and 15 seasons, which is sort of unbelievable. And we sort of stand for something in the marketplace, and we, we stand for something in the eyes of our consumers. Uh, and they're looking for us to tell them you know, what it means to get healthy and what it means to, to you know, sort of diet and, and what it means uh, for nutrition and, and what kind of weight loss programs they should be on and what kind of fitness programs they should be on. So we sort of stand for this. We stand for this, this sort of uh, very uh, lifestyle-driven uh, weight loss and diet uh, brand now. And then what we do to engage them uh, on a regular basis is just make really great entertaining television uh, that we can then communicate those healthy messages through. Um, and we do that now uh, across so many different platforms. So we've got the on-air component. Uh, we've now got digital components, which we didn't have 10 years ago when the show launched. So that's an interesting dynamic that we now have to bring in through, through uh, our, all those platforms, social media. And, and at the end of the day, that's, that's what counts. And then we, we have to you know, make something that's entertaining, that's engaging, that has that emotional connection, that emotional hook, so that we can work with brands like General Mills, so that we can also develop our own Biggest Loser uh, product, products, uh, and be able to sort of share that and communicate through that, through that portal of the show, which, you know, at the end of the day, we're only as good as many viewers that we get. Um, so yeah, so we sort of stand for this, we have this very interesting dynamic. So that's from my, my perspective. I mean, I, I feel like The big, Biggest Loser really stands for hope and empowerment. You know, it really gives people who have been struggling so mightily to deal with a health issue and to deal with a problem that's really, you know, almost ruin their lives. Absolutely. And you give them the way to solve that problem. And we opened up something that people didn't talk about a lot 10 years ago. No one knew what the show was going to do. It was a social experiment. Is anybody going to care? Is anybody going to relate? And then we found out every, a lot of people relate. There's a lot of people that weren't talking about obesity. And so we did. We were able to, to bring them these contestants, these people that, that they identified with, and that gave them hope, and they, they could relate to and inspire them to, to do it themselves and do it at home. So yeah, we've got all these great, these great hooks now. David, I mean, you, you're at the forefront of what I think are some of the most well-understood brands in America, maybe in the world. 
and very formal brand architectures. Help this audience understand what something like Cheerios stands for. What is the essence of its brand? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, what Cheerios is as a product is pretty simple, right? It's, you can read it on the side of the panel, um, but it's obviously so much more than that. And so, you know, you think about that brand and it's like, what is your purpose? Um, you need to have a voice. Who are you trying to reach? Um, and, you know, I think Biggest Loser is a great example of how we've been able to kind of make that connection. So you think about, okay, here's a product that's low calorie, low sugar, um, but, but who cares about that? And like you just said, an emotional show like Biggest Loser, and we can tap into that and say, here is what we offer. This is the solution. This is a way to kind of um, help you on that journey. And that product becomes a trusted source for someone. Um, and Cheerios is probably the best example. You know, it is, there's nothing terribly special about a Cheerio, right? It's, a, it's an oat circle. Um, it's almost yet, the beauty of it. Exactly, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, you talk to, you know, moms, it's the trusted first baby food. Um, you know, you talk all the way up through boomers that still kind of, you know, always have a box of Cheerios in their house. And it's, and it's more than just a breakfast food. And that's what we try and do across all of our brands, um, is figure out how do you elevate them from, you know, what, uh, what an R&D team turns over to you that is a great product for whatever reason, it's convenient, it tastes great, um, it's healthy, and then you have to find who does this really matter for and how do we connect with them? And that, like, you have to know who that person is. Um, you gotta go out, you gotta talk to them, you have to know them, and it's more than just, you know, pulling data and, and looking at reports. So I think that's a, that's a really important piece that a lot of times gets overlooked. Let's talk about that in a minute. Nadim, I'm really interested as you have these experiments in the market, have innovated in so many spaces. How are you beginning to understand where your product begins and ends and where your brand starts to get built? So, um, you know, I've, uh, I've taken on quite a challenge about 10 years ago with, um, with creating a, a hardware device. Um, it's actually a lot easier these days. Um, but when we first started, you know, I, I realized very quickly that, um, that just a step counter or just an accelerometer uh, was not emotional enough. Um, and so I got fixated on the heart, and I got fixated on the data that comes from the heart um, and how emotional that can actually be. Um, and so, yes, the product is a device, you know, from basis standpoint, it's a device that picks up your heart rate and a whole bunch of other um, uh, uh, sensor points um, from temperature and galvanic skin response and whatnot, monitors your activity, your sleep, um, but very much uh, more so, it stands for, it, it really stands for that you care about wellness. You, you know, I've likened it before to, uh, to the Prius, if you will, of the healthcare industry, that you're kind of making a statement. And so we spent a lot of time in R&D to make it fashionable, um, to, make it, uh, to make it customizable, um, so that you can personalize it. Um, but very much basis itself stands for um, kind of, you know, supercharging your day or becoming more superhuman, if you will, because there's so much we do in our days. Um, and finally, we have tools for awareness um, and how we can manage them. Um, and from a BioBeats perspective, you know, I, I really saw that, um, that patients were being treated like patients and that people that are sick um, really don't have engaging, fun tools to use to manage, to manage their health or to forget that they're sick while monitoring their health. And so BioBeats is really an experiment. It's really around merging entertainment and healthcare to, to see uh, how we can uh, create more engaging experiences. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about the brand itself and what we've done. Um, but the products really over there are really experiments. They're, in, they're in, in that stage. So we're building a brand first and a product second. So again, uh, a brand that really stands for um, maybe even belonging, you know, part of a cohort that cares about their health is being proactive, is taking charge of their lives. That's an aspirational idea in the marketplace and wanting to be one of those people and being associated with a brand who identifies and coalesces those people right. and brings them together and creates experiences. Let's talk about experiences a little so bit. They just put up my slides for some reason, but I don't know. If, hold on on that for a second, guys. <laughs> until we actually reach it. Or, or it's right here. This, so let me just speak to it while it's on the screen. Sure. Um, go back one slide, please. There, so that's the basis band. You'll see at the bottom there's all kinds of cool little um, straps that we can put on it and everything from this carbon steel that makes it very business friendly and some famous artists that design straps. Um, the device itself, 
uh, monitors the, the, you know, the, the data metrics I talked about. Um, you know, it automatically detects run, walk, and bike. Um, and of course, we have mobile applications and whatnot. Uh, it's based in San Francisco. Um, next slide. The, what we're launching here at CES is kind of taking our feature set to the next level. We've done some really interesting studies and analysis and figured out that we can pick up sleep to a, to a very deep level. And so we're launching, um, we're, we're announcing and then launching at the end of the month um, advanced metrics around REM cycles. We can pick up your REM cycles, your light sleep, deep sleep, and tossing and turning. Um, but as you can see, Basis has slowly rolled out features over time to continuously engage our users. Next slide. Uh, and really just the roadmap for, you know, please do come visit our booth, but the, the roadmap is really around more features, more advanced sleep metrics, um, and, and more of what our, our, our device can do. And what you just saw was an experiment called Pulse. Um, I talked a little bit about it, but Pulse 2.0 is, is kind of the next phase of the experiment. Uh, you'll see kind of closer to the end of the month and, and into the next month some very more significant famous artists and independent artists will be providing more music. Um, and a, more, a, a bigger suite of apps will come. Um, so please do kind of follow BioBeats and, and be engaged in our experiments. Um, we're building a brand first and, and products are coming. What I want to know, is that your heartbeat right now that we're hearing? Is that a live stream? <laughs> um, it's no. not mine currently, but it's probably his. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually strapped a DJ up with, um, we, we hacked together a Holter monitor, a baby Doppler, and we put it on a DJ just so the DJ can stream his own heartbeats through the system. Crazy, very cool. Yes, yeah, crazy. <laughs> I mean, I think that you know your your rundown of your of your product and its features and how it works is a great example of there's there's a product and then there's there's the aspirational you know representation emotionally in the marketplace of what all that means to people. Right. And you know, I think what we do see is we see brands, especially in emerging areas and technology where they're developing a lot of features and benefits and they're kind of backing into a brand story, which is perfectly fine. I mean, I think it's a perfectly rational, realistic thing to do. But getting to the brand story is why this session's called Nirvana, because the vig on your business is really in capturing that emotional engagement and being able to monetize that. And that's what a brand does for your business. Let's talk a little bit about how we're getting brands into market today because we were, we all know, and David, you know in particular, a lot of the big consumer brands that we're familiar with were all built with mass media, yep. primarily through advertising where the message was really controlled, the image was really controlled, and there wasn't a whole hell of a lot of commentary going on about whether people agreed or disagreed. Now we're in a completely different environment and brand strategy needs to fit into this new environment and create fit with its customers in different ways. Yeah. How are you guys using the new platforms to actually advance brands? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that is at the crux of probably everything we focus on right now. You know, you think 20, 30 years ago, not really jokingly, your big decision was, do I want to put this TV spot on one television channel or all three? Um, and now it's way beyond TV. And so I think um, we, we at General Mills have really started to even change the structure of how we go to market. So we've brought in new digital teams, so people who are 100% um, devoted and committed to what we are doing in the digital space. So our social streams, um, you know, the, the URLs we're building, everything. Um, and that's something that didn't exist three years ago. I think we've also tried to take ownership of a lot more of that conversation. You know, we talk about, I think what you said is absolutely right. We've, the, you know, it used to be that you sort of pushed the message and, and you tried to get, get that as smart as you could and, and be right, but, um, but you didn't have that sort of constant, the conversation and the back and forth with consumers like we do now. And so we need to own that conversation and it needs to be in house for us and it needs to be real time and it needs to be a team that is ours and that is collaborating and that is listening. Um, and, that, and that balance, right? Because there are a lot of voices out there. Um, and so, you know, how do you be respectful of the feedback and the comments? Um, because that is truly what drives a lot of these brands forward. And it's what helps us understand where is the sweet spot? You know, like, who are the people that really care about this? And maybe we're missing something. You know, maybe, maybe Fiber One has a totally different market that we haven't figured out. And, and you start to hear that as you open up these social streams and people say, hey, did you know this is a, you know, a great product for this? Or, you know, uh, Gogurt is a great example. We never would have thought of putting Bogart in the freezer, um, but that came from moms who are like, I need something to put in my 
my son's lunchbox, and I can't send yogurt because I don't feel good about what it does after four hours sitting out, throw it in the freezer. So like little things like that that we probably would have never thought about. Um, and so I think you know that is that's that conversation is constant and it is ongoing. And so we have I think tried to change both the way we structure, but also the way we operate. So this, go ahead. Were you I was going to say, and that goes to the, you know, the innovation side of what I think is so great about General Mills. We've been in partnership with them through the show now for nine seasons. Wow. Uh, and, and very early in the, in the days of integration, uh, when, when it was sort of something that brands were thinking about, they didn't know how it would work, no one really knew how it would work. <laughs> um, and, and they really jumped on board very early. And uh, we've integrated now over 11 different you know, individual yep. uh, health and wellness brands in the portfolio. And, uh, and it's been great. I mean, we've had some really great success stories with, mm -hmm. with lo product launches uh, in particular when we've launched them off the back of the show through a really great entertainment message, something that's engaging, that's informative. And, and we've really been able to move yeah. the needle on products like Lara Bar Absolutely. and some of the other. Um, and, and that's something probably 10 years ago we would have just guessed, right? We would have talked and we've been like, oh, let's try it with this. And we don't really know what that looks like. But now, because you guys have built out that suite of like, there's an online experience and there's so much more we can do that we can work with our brands and say, what's really, what are the right ones and the best fit? Um, and, and play around with that. And even after, you know, after something is on now air, I think back to when this started and it was sort of, that was it. Right. Was it. And it was great, but that was it. And it happened and, and you'd see a great response in sales. And now that's only the start of it. Right. right, because then is when the comments start, and that's when that conversation. And so, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all these things that nine seasons ago weren't helping Didn't us exist. drive the conversation. <laughs> really? Right, and so now that is, you know, I think it has totally changed the way we think about. Yeah. You are so good at amplifying. They amplify across, as he said. We'll have the show. We're going to have one integration and one episode. But that's really the the beginning, and they'll, you know, blast it out through Facebook and Twitter. They'll also do retail activations, FSIs. I mean, they're doing digital campaigns. So really, uh, you know, sort of piggyback off of the equity that we've built with the brand to target that audi yeah. audience even more specifically. Yeah. You need to have a whole different kind of stamina, right? Yes. To, in in market now, which I think is really interesting for startups because they don't have to change their infrastructure in the way they go to market. They can adopt the new media, the new ways of engagement right out of the gate, right? So we don't, you guys had to go back to yeah. learning how to reintroduce your products right. and, and these landscapes, and they're actually using these tools to, to write at launch. Let's talk a little bit about um, how you learn about your customers. You know, it, how do you get customer insight? How do you use, um, social and mobile and traditional research now to really get that brand insight going. Nadim, do you have? Uh, sure. Um, so from brand insight, um, you know, there's, there's the ability to, you know, I, for this project, BioBeats, I actually left San Francisco. Um, I, I built basis in San Francisco and raised significant capital and built a, and helped build a pretty amazing team. But for BioBeats, I wanted to, to get out into LA get out into Hollywood, um, get out into the UK, in some, into some of the clinical establishments, and see if you could really merge um, healthcare and entertainment. Would somebody like some of my angel investors, like Will Smith or Deepak Chopra, could they resonate with this healthcare message? Would they want to push it? Um, simultaneously, would a medical institution um, resonate with the fact that someone like Will Smith or Scooter Braun or some of our people want to promote this product? Um, what we found was a resounding yes. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a need to marry um, entertainment and healthcare, as, as you do very well. Um, and so that insight was kind of from the industry itself. Um, and then, of course, through digital media and, 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 uh, and all these tools we have, the feedback is instant. Um, and so we have, you know, just while we're doing betas of our apps um, and, and building beta groups that are international around the world, um, the insight that we get back is much more than just product feedback. Um, they can't help themselves the, to, to provide brand feedback and provide, you know, we have a video um, that we produced. It's on the homepage of biobeats.com. Um, I actually talked to some people at Canon about, uh, about our story and our message, and they decided to fund a short documentary on Biobeats because of Very the message, cool. yeah. right? because of, of what we're talking about, not how are we going to get it done, but why. Um, and, and that was a real testament 
to, to the brand we're building. I also think it, it's, 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 a, it's a whole new availability that, uh, of, of insight and perspective that actually becomes part of who you are. The fact that you ask, the fact that you're engaged, mm -hmm. the fact that you're engaged with your customers, that you're engaged with the celebrities that you're engaged with, that you've reached out to the institutions, and you make that knowledge, that starts to accrue to how people see you as a brand. Mm -hmm. It's not just research, it's the behavior in the marketplace that's so transparent right now. Mm. And that transparency is a big part of branding yeah. because people want to know, they want the narrative. Yeah. I mean, yeah. are, you're, you must be using social to you know, figure out a lot yeah. of stuff. I mean, I think um, every one of our large brands has someone who is, their full-time job is to manage our social channels. Um, and you know, three, four, or five years ago, um, when, you know, we had agencies manage that for us, and they'd set it up. And now it is, it is literally real-time conversations every day. Something comes in, you respond to it immediately, or think about you know what the right response is. That transparency is so big now, and I think what it what it translates into is people are looking for authenticity, right? They want to feel like you are a believable brand. And a lot of that is you have to do your homework, you have to go talk to people. I think that is one thing you will. There is no replacement. Even as we have more and more data at our fingertips and ways to collect that, um, I still believe there's no you know, replacement for going out and talking to somebody and understanding like what is what does their life look like? Because one brand, you know, one of our favorite quotes at General Mills is, you know, I don't tell people about your I don't tell my friends about your brand because I love your brand. I tell my friends about your brand because I love my friends. Right? It is not because we're not the most important part of someone's life. Um, but we need to figure out how we can make their life better. And how you can fit into their life in Absolutely. a way that's meaningful to them. Yeah, yep. yeah on the social side for, for us, it's an interesting listening tool. Um, and very rarely do we have the ability to in, interact sort of real time, meaning if we're going to create a, a television episode. We've probably shot it about five, six <laughs> months ago before <laughs> it goes into on, on to air. Um, but sometimes it sort of lines up where we're, we're in post-production during the airtime. And it happened last season, we, we in, for the first time in the show, we introduced kids, um, and nobody knew how that was going to go. So we, we, we really dialed it back, we, we brought them in, um, we introduced them, and then we really sort of, you know, sort of, they were a very subtle sort of B story. Um, but the audience said, where are the kids? It was, where are they? We want to see these kids. We want to know what they're doing. Childhood obesity is a, is a huge issue. Um, again, that, that authenticity, that, that relatability, um, and not seeing anything like it uh, on television before. And so we were able to take those comments, and they actually impacted the, the show. We went back, re-edited, and brought the kids in more for the later half of the season. So it's interesting, but it's also a rabbit hole. We were talking about it last yeah. night of, how far, how much do you let that audience determine it, or the, the consumer yep. determine through their social comments how you then market? Because at some point, you have to sort of drive the train. Um, and as we know, social can be used for, for evil as much as it can be used for good uh, when it comes to that sort of chatter that you get. Well, that's why we think it's a, really, it's a really important place to gain insight. But what you do with that insight mm -hmm. is how you architect your business and how you leverage it to, to build relevancy and to build connections. This whole idea of um, partners, you know, the idea of brands don't go it alone anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's very rare that, you know, somebody tries to launch something without the help of or the support of a media environment, another um, branded <coughs> entity or, you know, celebrity. How important do you think you know who you surround your brand with and the kind of partners are to your success now? I, I mean, I think it's critical. I think that you, you know, this is a perfect example why we went after Biggest Loser. Like, it was the right show at the right time, but it absolutely aligned with what we were trying to do at General Mills and with the brands that we were looking to put on that show. Um, and, and, and again, I come back to sort of you know the insights we had into our consumers, but we knew how the product was fitting their life, but we knew bigger picture what they were trying to accomplish. And for many of them, it was that weight loss journey that they were struggling with. And that was something that Biggest Loser could credibly help us in that space. It was um, very believable. It was an emotional connection for people. And so it starts to put together a journey and it's a holistic experience for people about what they're going through in their life. And it's not just this collection of 
brands or platforms that you know piece it together to make something. It is you know purposefully throughout my day what is going to help me towards whatever goal that is or achieving whatever I want to get to. So your brands plus the biggest loser brand. How do you identify the right, the right. fit, the right brand fit? Yeah, with it's, your entity. It's so critical because it does come back always. I think we, we've used the word authentic so many times, but today, but it's so critical. It's so crucial. And if we were to bring in a partner that wasn't an authentic, wasn't a good match, wasn't something that we could credibly go out and advocate and, and, and effectively endorse, then we would be hurting our audience. We would be hurting our consumer, um, hurting our brand. So we uh, very you know, smartly, very early on, we brought in um, uh, nutritionists, we brought in doctors, who basically formed what it means to, to be on the Biggest Scissor program. And this applies to the contestants in the show, as well as all of our off-air uh, products, so our, our books, our online uh, weight loss program, uh, our resorts follow the same sort of guidelines. And, and when General Mills, for instance, comes to us every season and says, these are the products that we want to integrate, um, we say, great, send us all the nutrition details, send us everything, and we vet it through the doctors. And most times they, they meet, they pass muster, and, and they're gonna sort of uh, approved. But often, sometimes, you know, yep. a couple times yep. a season, there's a brand, uh, one, of the, one of their individual brands that maybe has too much sugar content, too many calories, not enough protein, and we're, we're sort of unable to integrate that into the show. And that kind of mm. filter is what keeps us relevant and, and keeps us uh, on that sort of forefront. And that applies to not just General Mills, but mm -hmm. any product that we put on the show, especially for anything uh, food related uh, is critical. So yeah, absolutely. It's so, yes, critical um, to, to partner and to, to launch with someone. From a startup perspective, um, you know, un fortunately or unfortunately, um, when, you're, when you're a startup and you have to go out there and get, most importantly for most startups, you have to go and get some financing. Um, that in itself is a branding exercise. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's absolutely not enough to just have a product. Um, you need to have a team, you need to have a story, you need to talk about your market, you gotta have a beautiful PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I first started Basis, um, you know, it was 2004, and I ended up raising um, over six million in angel money over five years just for R&D. And there was no, um, it was, I had no prototype. Um, I didn't have anything to be able to show what the product was, and so it's really a story. And some of your early angel investors are part of your story. Um, just like BioBeats, you know, part of the story is some of the early angel investors that have come into the, pro into the project, which helped me with the next step um, and taking it to market. So from a startup perspective, if you don't understand branding, and if you're not able to create, um, create your project into a brand at an early stage, uh, it's gonna be really hard to get it off the ground, especially now with crowdfunding, um, and and with, uh, with AngelList and all these online places that you can just throw your startup out to the world and hope people participate, um, that's very much a branding exercise. I think this notion, we touched on it a second ago, of story, your brand story being the basis of your brand equity that, you, that you're investing in, it can change and it can grow, but you lay down a foundation of a narrative story that people can get engaged with. I think you guys have done that pretty beautifully. Thank you. You know, and in terms of, you might not have a brand equity yet, in, in, or some startups might not have one yet, but the way they start building one is they start telling their story in engaging ways across multiple platforms and getting people involved in that story, and then over time it accrues to, to their brand equity. Mm -hmm. And this idea of, the, the surface area of a brand, I'll um, credit my friend Mark Beeching for that, that, that idea of a surface area now, which is m so multiple components of where you touch people and how you get engagement. And I think you know, all of you guys feel like you're working across a much broader swath of media than ever before. Absolutely, absolutely. I think with, with us, it's so, uh, as we talked about in the beginning, going from sort of an entertainment platform to a brand, and now how that shifts based on consumer needs. You know, there's so many more health and diet products in the market. There's so many more tools, like what, what BioBeats is doing, Basis, um, that it becomes cluttered. It's how do you distinguish your message? How do you talk about what you mean and what you yeah. stand for? 
you know, we're lucky because we have the, the show, but if, we're not, if we don't have a concise message and a concise story to tell you why you should be consuming us, uh, meaning consuming our, our actual products for you, um, it gets lost, it's ineffective. So we're constantly sort of fine tuning that um, as we go into new seasons and as well as, as working with partners to define what, what our story is, and it does change, and it always sort of has a through line, but season on season, there is a, different, a slightly different message. You know, I would, I would encourage everybody who's working in a, in a new product space to force yourself through the exercise of doing a brand pyramid. You can find lots of examples online and, you know, you could maybe find some experts to help you. But force yourself through the exercise of actually drawing that out and then trying to use your decision making against living up to that. You know, if you have a brand promise, if you're going to stand for something in the market, put that down on paper and then let your actions in promotion, in partnerships, in, in how you develop your product live into that brand promise and see how much further and faster you get to something that actually feels like brand equity. I think a lot of people skip that step and it's, a, it's an important step. I want to talk a little bit about health care and health and wellness and brands and products because I think it's a really tough space because I think everybody wants it. Everybody wants it. But not everybody's that interested in it. <laughs> and um, when push comes to shove, they kind of want a magic pill. They don't really want to do too much to get it. So how do we create engagement around things that people wish they could just get it over with? I could just lose weight. I could just manage my cholesterol. I could just <laughs> you know, make sure that my kids aren't eating too much sugar. How do we get people engaged in wanting and investing in doing the right thing? Make it cool. <laughs> make it fun. Simple, make it exciting. Yeah. Use entertainment. Healthcare is boring. Healthcare is a, a chore. Like losing weight, eating right, it's not the, the first choice right, that you're going you're gonna to make. Um, and so we have to take cues from the entertainment industry. Um, you know, the, the, the music apps, the uh, the, the entertainment properties, you know, they've created, a, they've created an addiction um, because entertainment hits that part of your brain that you just want to keep doing it. Um, and, so, and so we have to take those lessons of healthcare companies, um, whether it be, uh, you know, creating a TV show out of losing weight, um, it makes it look more fun. It makes it look like there's a support group and I'm part of something. Um, or whether it be, uh, you know, the, the US.gov app, right? Um, taking cues from some of these startups and having some good UX or putting some gamification into their apps. Um, it's, it's critical uh, that we make it fun and exciting and engaging and forget that we're actually trying to get healthy, um, at least for a short period of time. I think that's spot on. We, you know, we can create a lot of great food um, and that's what we focus on but we need those partners to help us. I think that is absolutely right. It's, you know, whether it's a, competi a competitive, you know, spin on it or just fun, you, you need something that doesn't make it feel like a chore. Mm. And then when you do have the entertainment platform, it is a fine line between a sales push and entertainment. Yeah. And how do you, where is the balance? Where, you know, and we're always playing with it. Um, and you can become, you know, we've been able to become slightly more heavy handed. Our audience now accepts that we're going to push and talk about products, but it works because they want the information. They want to know what to do when they get to the aisle in the supermarket and they want something healthy and they just aren't educated. So they, they look to us to tell them, you know, what, what, is, what is acceptable, you know, is it Cheerios or is it another product? And so it, it's something that we, we play with, but it is, it's, an, it's a constant battle, and we battle with it too, you know, ourselves. So like going, we, you know, we want to be entertaining, we want to be super engaging, but we really do want to put, you know, we really do want to advocate and, and essentially market the products that are our own as well as our partners. So that it's, a, it's a very fine line. That's, That's why a, you're sitting in the world. middle. That's why I'm in the middle. <laughs> because because yeah. it's, you really are helping people navigate. That's yeah. part of your brand value proposition, right? Helping people sort out what's what. So they want that from you. Yeah, you know, they, we, they, as long as they don't feel the bias. That's right. And yeah. it's part of that thing we just talked about last night is then getting the feedback. 
and seeing what, uh, what they respond to. What is driving them to actually go then and consume? And we have like an interesting case with Lara Bar, because it was a new story, a new product, and people were really surprised that the product had nothing in it but about seven ingredients that were super wholesome. And it literally, I mean, it lit, it, I mean, it, it lit up the category. Um, and we were able to actually see percentage of growth and, and some real uh, impact to the brand, which is interesting and, and really great for us, because then it fuels you know, how we then take that and, and translate and do that message the next season. And that's a perfect example, right? That was a brand that is not a Cheerios, right? It's not a household name. It's great. And so you have an audience um, that, that believes and trusts the biggest loser and what they offer. And so they see that and they say, you know what, because you've built uh, an authentic and believable connection and partnership, I trust that, right? And so it, it cuts out some of the work for us of having to do, you know, this, um, believe this, it, this really is a great product because it's, it's tied right in there. And my, my good friend who I was with last night, um, Gary Vaynerchuk, put out a book just recently called Jab, 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 Hook. And it's beautifully described. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the jabs being providing value, 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 and the hook being a sales pitch um, and, and trying to close is just beautifully um, kind of presented on how to present your brand on different platforms and, and how to go about it. Um, but it's such a fine line that we have to walk. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's that, that, that value in the eyes of your customer that you have new ways to get that insight. I think the Laura Bar example is so interesting because simplicity, again, you know, when people make healthcare decisions, it's, there's such a cacophony and it's so chaotic and you're so insecure and there's so much conflicting information that seven ingredients is like a big idea. <laughs> because it's just like, oh, I should be looking for things that have fewer ingredients. Laura Bar is actually teaching people to, to choose and to keep an eye out for things that have too many ingredients. Mm. This becomes part of that you know, future equity, I think, when, to Nadim's point earlier, that simplicity in our story and in our you know, offering so people can actually engage without feeling overwhelmed. Mm. And, what it, and what it can do for them. I think one side is certainly the, the food side, the product side. Um, um, in that regard, the nutrition. But the other side is, is are things like new technologies that people don't understand why they need them a lot of times. You know, it's, oh, it's a great thing to have. I get to see my, my heartbeat and I get to measure my, I get, you know, I get to track these things, but what can it do for me? So we're constantly also talking about the why they should be doing things, why that they, you know, should, should be aware of this, why they should try to adopt that behavior for themselves at home to help, you know, lead a, uh, lead a healthier lifestyle. So it's the sort of push of yeah. here's products to buy and purchase, and then here are things that you should be doing and sort of changes that you can make, and here's products that can also help on that side. And then mixed in with a really great entertaining, make you cry show. That's the idea. But again, you're getting back to the role of emotion. Yeah. So it's not all rational features and benefits, that the emotional hook has to be part of the brand essence and then we continue to burnish that with the choices we make as marketers and as business people in bringing our products to market. I don't know how much time I have left because this has said 26 minutes for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. All right, I, I have 10 minutes. Um, I have one more quick question for you guys, though, and then we'll maybe try and get five minutes of Q&A. So what are you jealous of? like brand wise, like who's launched something that you've seen Virgin. recently that <laughs> you were like, oh my God, that's so juicy and smart. Mm. I, you know, I always take a page out of Richard Branson's book. I mean, every time he launches something and he puts his own effort into it, it's, it's something to learn from. Um, beyond that, you know, it's, some, just, it's, it's a constant study with, with a lot of the entertainment properties that are coming out and the ways movies are marketing themselves and how they're using platforms and, and even TV shows and how they're engaging audiences. Um, I constantly want to learn from that to apply it to really healthcare. Smart. Mm -hmm. Really smart. Yeah, I think for us, there's, there's not, we're, we're fortunate, we don't have a lot of competition in the television space. Um, on the brand side, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're we're in that, like I said, it's in a very, very saturated market. There's so many weight loss and diet tools out there. Um, and one of the, I think, interesting launches recently was the uh, Livestrong. Uh, they did their own 
uh, now extension uh, into like a, an online weight loss service. And I thought their launch was really interesting, and it was an interesting play off of a brand that you wouldn't think is related to diet, but they had this sort of equity, this, this, this brand that they had built that now they could go into that space. And that scared me a little bit because it means you don't just have to live in the weight loss and the diet and the life you know, style space. You can now come from a, a you know, Disease. sort of, and from a disease and launch into these uh, these new areas. So it was something to just sort of made my light bulb go off and sort of be thinking that it's now going to get even more crowded when we, we can allow those kinds of brands to launch into this space. I think, um, you know, every day almost I'm amazed by some new hardware or software, and I think that is going to really change the way brands think and the way that partnerships become um, more critical. I think as I look out there in the landscape and thinking about brands every day, I'm always um, jealous of the people who just nail that like purpose, right? And it's like you see, it, easiest to see come to light in a TV spot, but usually it's blown out, you know, through a digital kind of surround. Um, Old Spice is sort of the classic example. Um, I love what um, TurboTax just launched a new commercial. I think is fantastic. I think Expedia had an amazing campaign behind the Find Yours. There are so many of them. Patagonia, right? The list goes on and on. And so I think we try and always look to benchmark outside of food to say like, what are other people doing and how are they nailing that insight so that they can then take their amazing product but talk about it in a way that's so much bigger than the, than the functional benefits of that product. My favorite launch was Nest, which made you like fall in love with your thermostat, which is something that I have no personal connection to. <laughs> but the, the, the idea that you could use the word love up against a thermostat and really create the sense of social environmental responsibility and appeal to a cohort that's completely not connected to any, you know, their thermostat in any way. I thought that was kind of an elegant and beautiful launch. And I know that they have a big footprint here at, at CES. So anyway, so let's open it up a, to we, some we questions question in the audience. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ben. And this question is you talked about listening to the social discussions around your products and brands and shows and such. And could you just touch on both the methodology and even tools that you do use to listen and then act on what you hear out in the space, yeah. the ecosystem? Um, so we, like I said, we have dedicated teams on our brands that like literally are managing the conversation 10, 12 hours a day. Um, and so usually what we'll do is we're sort of on a two week cycle and so we will proactively plan out two weeks worth of content that we you know, think is relevant, that we've brainstormed. Um, but give ourselves the flexibility to adjust within that. And so it is, you know, somebody sitting down the hall from us who comes and says, hey, so-and-so just posted this, what do we want to do with it? Um, and so we sort of, you know, then have a, a decision tree to decide is the answer, do something now, do something in the next couple days, not do anything right now. So, um, but I think it's important to kind of have structure behind it, but then also give yourself the flexibility because so much of it is real time. You can't, you can't get by just, constantly responding to everything you need to have a little bit of a, a vision and try and guide the conversation, but um, you're not pushing it out there like, like we once were. Mm. We have another question over here. Is it, did anyone, sorry. Hi, Monica. I also work in an area where there's a lot of stigma, which I imagine must be an issue in obesity as well. I'm wondering how you use social media to overcome some of that stigma. It's an interesting question. Um, it's a little bit like what David said. We're using, you know, the traditional tools, right? So we're on Facebook and Twitter, uh, you know, traditionally to talk about um, the show from an entertainment, you know, standpoint. Tune in, you know, check us out this this coming week. But we're also using it to talk about our new products as well as, you know, the contestant story. They're the ones that get over the stigma uh, that allow us to to talk about it in a relevant way because we're using a real example. So if it's, you know, for instance, we're, you know, using uh, Danny Allen, who was our winner from last season, we're going to do a series of Google Plus Hangouts with her, um, and using new, you know, new platforms to just to sort of get her back out there, talk about her story, what she's doing, how she's keeping the weight off, and allow the consumer, allow the viewer, to engage with her uh, in real time and ask questions that they might be more fearful of asking, you know, in a non, in, in a in a less intimate environment. Um, we're also using you know, other, other platforms as well, such as Instagram and Pinterest, uh, and just sort of playing around with, with what people want to engage with. Um, but, uh, but that's traditionally how we're doing it. Maybe one last question. Yeah. Um, in, in medicine, we're very concerned about 
uh, drawing the line between the science and the and commercial interests. How do you, in terms of relating to your viewers, uh, make clear that, that in fact there is a linkage between the commercial interests and, and, and what you're presenting, that it's not a, a purely uh, objective? I think at this point they're they're pretty aware. I think at this point um, we we are pretty we're pretty heavy not heavy handed. I, I would say it's a good balance. It's a good mix, um, and we we try to do the the integrations and and the um, sort of advertisements for our partners in ways that it, it does feel like more of a direct message. So we started bringing in elements that are uh, sort of a tip format. So we'll have the main narrative of the show sort of go into sort of an, almost an act out, and it pops up almost as though it's a separate commercial pod, where it still feels like it's, it's part of, you know, creatively it looks and feels like the Biggest Loser brand, but it's a more direct call to action, as well as mixing in with, it, with more linear integrations uh, along the way. Um, so it's a, it's a mix, but of course, you know, we, we've sort of taken the approach of owning it, right? So it's Biggest Loser is telling you, this is a partner of Biggest Loser. We don't really rely on, you know, Jillian Michaels or Dolvet or, or Bob Harper to say that they advocate for these brands. It's really, it's really the Biggest Loser. And so you really just have to own it. And that's been our, our mantra. And that's sort of helping us then, you know, really effectively integrate these products. Excellent. I hate to cut you off, but uh, thank you so much. That was thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Huge round.